does not depend on any one particular company in order to maintain it, and where your, your use of this identity is not limited to kind of that one company's ecosystem. So you can, use, you can use blockchains for this. So you can use blockchains in order to register names, in order to potentially register websites, in order to register anything where there are a number of users. So there's um, already something like uh, somewhere over 100,000 people, or at least 100,000 registrations on ENS somehow, which is the Ethereum name system, have already taken place. <laughs> Um, this is another kind of test, uh, pro uh, test project. So this one is uh, by the uh, United Nations. And like a lot of these large governments and like, a large business and institutional applications still tends to be very early stage. And, but you know, the, the, uh, so what we have over here is, so this is the uh, United Nations Food Program. And in this uh, initial test, they were using <coughs> the um, Ethereum blockchain in order to uh, keep track of uh, remittances that they were sending to people in the Middle East so that they could buy food. So another simple application, but it could potentially provide a lot of value. So you know, when people talk about blockchains, a lot of people talk about using them to create a kind of very low cost infrastructure to financially empower uh, developing countries, to financially empower places that don't have infrastructure to financially empower places that, that are um, where currently there are wars and so no one can build infrastructure. And you know, here it's, it's starting to happen. And there are many other applications. And you know, here are just a few of those, a, a few of the categories. So the first category is uh, prediction markets. So this is basically you know, systems that you can use in order to make bets on events. So if he wants to make a bet that you know someone will win an election, that some company's stock price will go up, that you know some, in any event in the world will happen, you can even bet on the temperature. That you can use applications like applications like this to do it, and most of them are being built on Ethereum. Um, DAOs. So DAOs are this very um, interesting concept that has only kind of it really existed in people's uh, thoughts for maybe in the last uh, uh, several years. Um, so DAO stands for a Decentralized Autonomous uh, Organization. Um, and the idea is that you can think of a DAO as being like a smart contract, except the smart contract, it controls assets, it, control, it performs some service, and the contract is intended to exist for a very long time. And you can think of this smart contract as representing some organization and representing the rules by which people in this organization, by which people using some application or service interact with each other. So you can think of it as kind of like a digital company that only exists on, on the blockchain. And People are interested in using this for, in various applications, there are DAOs that are looking to do investment, there are DAOs looking to do charities, so there's many things that this can be used for. Um, financial applications, um, insur there's a few insurance projects, um, supply, chain, uh, supply chain tracking, using records that are saved on a blockchain to keep track of products being created, products being shipped, um, payments. So there's people using blockchains and people using Ethereum to do very many diff different kinds of things. Um, so uh, I can talk a bit about some of where um, Ethereum's uh, uh, technology is currently going and some of our roadmap for where we expect to be uh, the Ethereum protocol to be in the future. And I think that like one of the uh, one of the slides that I use sometimes to kind of explain why I think technology is such a big part of the challenge is this, right? So, if you look at the number of transactions per second, this is the number of operations every second that blockchains can process. So if you look at Ethereum, if you look at Bitcoin, most of the <coughs> still tends to be fairly low, right? So right now, the the amount of traffic that's going through the Bitcoin network is about three transactions a second. The amount of, of uh, traffic going through the Ethereum network 
is also about three transactions a second. But if he wants to get to the point where blockchains are being used for mainstream applications, then Uber, 12 transactions a second. PayPal, 200 per second. Visa, 2,000. DTCC, over 10,000. Alipay, 100,000. So if we want blockchains to be able to support large mainstream usage, then the technology has to improve in order to be able to handle all this load. So this is only one challenge. Right? And actually, I think that there are several different, different challenges uh, that we have to solve if we want uh, blo uh, blockchains in general to be used much more than they are now. So aside from uh, scalability, another very major and important one is security. So the blockchain protocol itself needs to be secure. So the blockchain itself needs to be able to resist DOS attacks, 51% uh, attacks, other kinds of attacks. Blockch blockchains are completely open systems. Anyone can interact with a blockchain, anyone can participate in a blockchain. What this also means is that anyone can attack a blockchain. And if there is a way to attack a blockchain, then anyone in the world can do this very easily. And so the need for blockchain protocols to be secure is very important. Um, also, applications on top of blockchains need to be secure. So smart contracts written on top of blockchains need to not have bugs in their code. They need to be, um, needs to do what, what, the, what they say they're going to do. Um, user interfaces need to be secure. The way that users interact with their applications need to be secure. We, the blockchain ecosystem needs to have some answer for what happens if I lose my private key. Um, scalability and also privacy. So with privacy, in, there are many kinds of applications where you do not need privacy. But there's also many applications where people want privacy. People do not want the entire world to know every single one of their payments. They do not want every, everyone in the world to know every single thing that, that, that's happening inside of their company, every single resolution that they're passing. And so we do need to find technologies to solve each of these problems. And we are working on uh, uh, solutions for each and every one of these. So um, here we talk about sharding, um, channels, side chains, off-chain protocols, zero-knowledge proofs, um, ring signatures, I uh, yeah, don't have time now to go into any of these in detail, although there are other meetups where I have talked about some of these separately. So for example, in Hong Kong, I did a meetup where I talked about zero knowledge proofs for about an hour. Um, there are other places where I talk about scalability <coughs> challenges. And if you want to kind of get into any of these topics much more deeply, then I would recommend that you uh, look into this more online. I want um, to so, Aside from these three things, um, well, as, a, as part of security, one of the major things that we are, that we are in the process of starting to do is uh, transition the uh, blockchain consensus algorithm from uh, something called proof of work to something called proof of stake. So the idea here is that if you look at uh, all lar mo mo most large blockchains right now, in, in order for the blockchain to um, remain secure, it relies on this kind of this uh, consensus algorithm, and this consensus algorithm is a, an algorithm that is run by many thousands of nodes that are all um, across the network. And the way proof of work works is it requires <coughs> each and every one of these computers in the network to constantly run a large amount of computation and a large of uh, basically, try to solve mathematical puzzles. And these mathematical puzzles do not have any value to themselves. The purpose of doing this computation and the purpose of solving these mathematical puzzles is basically to convince the network that you're not, that you're not trying to attack it, kind of. And it's, it's much more complex than that, but that's one simple way of thinking about it. But the problem is that this mechanism is, ex is extremely inefficient. And so if you look at uh, Bitcoin, for example, it's burning something like four to five million dollars per day of electricity and hardware costs. And Ethereum is also burning about four million dollars a day of electricity and hardware costs. So we're, 
you know, because we care about energy efficiency, you know, we care about the environment, and I know, I know China cares a lot about the environment too recently. Um, I, um, I don't know, we, we want to try to make the, make, our blo make the blockchain much more efficient, consume much less energy, and part of you know, why we're doing this, or part of what we're doing here is we are switching from proof of work. So from this kind of computationally intensive form of consensus to something that's called proof of stake. And the idea, the main difference between the two is that the way that a user participates in the network of proof of work is, the, or is through um, running large amounts of computation. And in proof of stake, it's more, it's, um, so with computation, you, you participate in the network by running a large amount of computation and, pr and by doing so, proving that you have access, to, that you control some, some assets in the real world. So when you, when you solve mathematical puzzles, when you run this computation, you're proving that you control some very powerful computer. In proof of stake, instead of proving that you control a very powerful computer, you're proving that you control coins inside of the network. So instead of using physical assets, it uses digital assets that are inside of the system. And by doing this, by, switch, by moving the consensus from being based on physical assets to being based on digital assets, we can remove most of the need for energy consumption. So the idea is that, in, so right now, if you, have, if you want to participate in the network as a miner in the proof of in, uh, Ethereum's proof of work system, you would need to buy a powerful computer, then connect this powerful computer to the network, and it would start running these computations, and in exchange, you would get some reward. With proof of stake, you would take money, you would use it to buy Ether, which is the cryptocurrency inside of Ethereum, and then this by itself will, be, will allow you to become a validator, so a, a participant of the network's consensus algorithm, a participant of the process by which the network agrees on which, which transactions to accept and which blocks to accept. Um, so it's the, or the transition to a Casper proof of stake will happen in two stages, where the first stage goes from our current pure proof of work to an algorithm where we have kind of hybrid, where it's part proof of work and part proof of stake, and later on we'll move to full proof of stake. So the main purpose behind this is like two, per two things. One of them is that we want to reduce the cost of uh, the blockchain coming to consensus, and the other is we want to increase its security. So this is one of the, one of the things that we are researching. Um, for scalability, as, as I mentioned, we do have uh, several different uh, research directions, and one of them in, is uh, this uh, strategy called sharding. And the idea behind sharding basically is that if you look at the way that all blockchains work today, you have a network. And this network contains a large number of computers. And every computer in this network has to process every transaction that's sent by any user in the entire system. So right now, Ethereum processes three transactions per second. This means that if you, run, if you run a node, if you are part of the Ethereum network, then your computer is processing three transactions per second. If Ethereum's capacity goes up to 1,000 transactions per second, then every computer in the network would be processing 1,000 transactions per second. Most computers cannot process 1,000 transactions per second, and so there is a limit. So the idea behind sharding is we can create blockchains <coughs> where instead of every computer in the network processing everything, every computer in the network processes only a small portion of all the transactions that, exist, that, 